Welcome to this video about Polaris, which is our North Star. Now, Polaris is a very important star because of where it sits in the sky, but there's also some other very interesting things happening with this star that we're going to have a look at in this video. So, it's very important because it is our North Star. It's located at the North Celestial Pole, which means that as the Earth rotates and we look out into the sky, it's always approximately in the same part. So all the other stars will appear to rotate around it and you get these really nice star trails if you uh, actually put a camera on the sky and watched it for a long period of time. Now it's not perfectly in the centre of that, but it's enough to use as navigation tools. So you can use it to find north, very useful star. But there's some interesting things happening with the star if you actually look at it in more detail. So the first thing really is that it's in a triple star system. There's not just one star there, there's actually three. Now the main one you can actually see is the central pair. So you can't resolve any of these really by naked eye, but you can actually see the bulk of it, which is the Polaris A. So Polaris A is a binary in the center. So Polaris A, A and Polaris A, B. So it's a larger one and a smaller one. Most of the luminosity, the brightness is coming from that Polaris A, A, which is the primary one. So those are orbiting their common centre of mass, and then you have a smaller Polaris B orbiting around the outside. So you've got this triple star system like this, and Polaris B is quite small. It's also quite a, away from it as well. Now, this illustration just gives you the general idea where the orbits are, but they're not to scale. So Polaris B would actually be quite a distance from the other two. Now, the outer Polaris B takes thousands of years to orbit the common centre of mass of the system, whereas the central two, Polaris AA and Polaris AB, their orbital period is about 30 years, so much, much faster than the outer one. That's because they're closer together. The other one is much further away, so a much, much wider orbit. So can we actually see them? Well, Polaris A and Polaris B, you can resolve with a fairly modest telescope. So you don't need really powerful telescopes to see these. So if, you, if you've got a telescope at home, go find the North Star, point it at Polaris, and you should be able to resolve that second smaller Polaris B. So you don't need a big telescope for this. You can easily see this with a fairly small telescope. So Polaris A comprises of both those two smaller ones close to each other, but they're too close for you to be able to resolve in your back garden. But you can see the outer one, that has the orbital period of about a thousand years. Now to see the components of the Polaris A, so the A and B bar part of Polaris A, you need a much more powerful telescope. So you won't be able to resolve this yourself, but to get that third one, that really small AB one next to the primary star, then you need something like Hubble, which is this image here. So if you zoom in on that one, you can just about resolve the smaller one. And it's because they're very close to each other and you need a really good angular resolution to be able to separate those two. So you need a powerful telescope to see all three, but you can see two of them with a fairly small telescope. Now, Polaris AA, so this is the primary one. This is the one that's actually, if you were to look into the sky and you associate the North Star with that star, that's mostly Polaris A, that's where most of the brightness is coming from. And this is a Cepheid variable, so this means that it actually pulsates over time, so it actually gets bigger, gets smaller, it changes its surface temperature. What that means is as we look at it, it actually gets brighter and then dimmer, and it has a repeatable pattern. So it's a, it repeats after so many days, and we have a, a period to that, so that pulsation period. So it would look something like this. If we had the apparent magnitude, now the apparent magnitude is how bright we actually see the star in the sky. If we were to measure that or just look, and we measure that over time, it would look a little bit like this. So you'd see it getting brighter, then dimmer, then brighter, and it has a regular pattern. And we can measure that period by looking at the, or the time between the maximum brightness and then the maximum brightness again. So that's the period of its pulsation period, which is actually very useful to know. So we can work that out quite easily. And this is an image, or I should say an animation actually, taken by Hubble of one of these types of pulsating variable stars. This is actually in the Andromeda galaxy, so it's not in our own galaxy, but you can see how it's actually getting brighter and dimmer, and also slightly changing colour as well. And you can see a lot of the other stars around it are not doing that. So the one in the centre is the pulsating star, and this is a real one actually doing that. 
So this is the actual light curve for Polaris A. And you can see, you've got that really nice period there. It's getting brighter, it's getting dimmer, brighter, dimmer. And we, you can easily work out what that period would be. Now the light curve is just the brightness of the star, or the, the flux given here actually, against time. So you can see it getting brighter and dimmer. This has been taken by TESS, which is a, t a telescope or space telescope designed to look for transiting exoplanets. But just because it's looking for transiting exoplanets doesn't mean it's not going to pick up anything else interesting. In fact, it's looking at lots of different sorts of stars, regardless of whether there are planets there or not. So you can get really good information about variable stars because it's tracking it over a long period of time and taking lots and lots of measurements. So that is a light curve. Once we've got that light curve, we can quite easily calculate a period. So the time between the maximum brightness and the next maximum brightness will give us our time period, which is the cycle it takes to do one pulsation. And there's a relationship between the period of these pulsating stars and their absolute magnitude. So what we can do is we can measure that period. We then look at this graph here. We go up to the yellow line, which is the, the trend. And then we go across to find out what its absolute magnitude would be. So once we have the absolute magnitude, we can then calculate a distance to it. So we would do something like this. So you, let's say we have a period there, we go up to the yellow line and across, we've then got its absolute magnitude. Now the absolute magnitude is a brightness of the star from a standard distance from a star of all stars. So the absolute magnitude is always from the same distance, whereas an apparent magnitude is how bright we actually see it in the sky. So if we, if we can measure how bright it appears to us and we know how bright the star is from a standard distance, we can then use a relationship there to get the distance, which is what we're going to do now. So if you use this equation here, you can get the distance to a star in parsecs. So this will be the distance in parsecs. You need to measure the apparent magnitude, which is your small m. The absolute magnitude is what we've just pulled off that plot. Because of that relationship between the period and the absolute magnitude, we can get that and then we can get a distance to it. So these pulsating stars are very, very useful for measuring distances in our local neighbourhood. They're not so great for doing very, very far distances because they're not that bright. You need supernovas and other measurements to do that. But for our local neighbourhood, these are very good for measuring distances. And it's actually how our local neighbourhood has actually been mapped out as well. So Polaris is just one of many variable stars that have been used to map out our own galaxy. So we're here at the yellow point on that map in our Milky Way, and all of those green dots there are the same type of variable stars as Polaris. And because we can work a distance to them, we can then map out where they are and get more of our local environment and the structure there. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoy, then you can check out some of the other videos.